Welcome everybody to our next uh, Future Focus web webinar um, from RM Partners. Um, we uh, are delighted to welcome you. This is the last one before our summer break and we had a request to have a think about some treatment options and pharmaco um, pharmacogenomics. Um, uh, so that's what we're going to do today. Um, so I'm going to start by just giving you an overview of the current SACT options um, and then uh, back by popular demand we've got Domisha um, who's come back to talk to us about the influence of uh, pharmacogenomics. So I'll launch in and we'll have some time for questions at the end, I think. So this is just an advert, which I'm sure um, Domisha will go through um, uh, as to come to her presentation if anybody's interested in this um, uh, conference uh, study day that's going on. So yeah, so I was asked to talk about um, some current uh, SACT treatment options, and um, I'm just going to take the next uh, 20 minutes or so to go through how we how we've applied the uh, what's currently available in practice. And uh, some of it will be refresher, some of it may may be new. So I hope it's of interest to you. So in terms of what we have uh, currently um, uh, as a treatment approach, when we think about SAC, SAC being the umbrella term, we have the traditional chemotherapy, of course, which we um, has been around for, for many, many years. Uh, we have the, the new kids on the block, which is the immunotherapy, um, which are monoclonal antibodies, vaccines and CAR-T. Um, and we have small molecules, um, which have uh, really um, taken off in the last decade. In the background, of course, we have hormones, uh, which I'm not going to talk about today, but they have been around as a, a way to um, stop the food chain for uh, for cancers and tumours. Um, uh, been around for many years, but I'm not going to talk about those today. So in order to understand uh, the treatment approaches, it is really important to understand the mode of action, which is which is the science really of what we do. So um, in the top, I hope you can see my mouse. Um, if not, I'll talk you through. But in the top um, corner, we have a traditional cell cycle, which is the basis of chemotherapy. Um, so a, a cell is born, it starts to replicate all its um, its nutrients and all the things that it needs to be that cell that it, it intends to be. And eventually, um, one cell, it pulls apart, one cell becomes two, two becomes four, and so on. This is the basis of chemotherapy, as we, the, the chemotherapy drugs go in and disrupt any of these processes so that the cell dies. In the top right, we have antibody. Uh, therapy and this is a structure of an antibody and again these have been around now for probably 25 years and what we're looking for here is a target on the surface of the cell so different to chemotherapy which is poisoning the cell we are we're looking for a target with the uh, the monoclonal antibodies and then the bottom left we have the small molecules um, which work on the inside of the cell this is a really important uh, difference so the cell surface being here and the, the okay. um, small molecules interrupt the pathway um, of the food chains for um, cell development and cancer development and then what we're not going to talk about today is the hormones which work outside and independent of the um, of the tumour cells itself, but they um, cause a blockade so that the, the cells, the tumour cells can't thrive. So thinking about where, where we've got to, um, the history of chemotherapy, of course, we've had chemotherapy for over 100 years and the real breakthrough came in the Second World War when uh, individuals were exposed to nitrogen mustard and uh, people started to develop lymphomas. And um, But importantly, uh, what was also noticed was um, people developed my myelosuppression or bone marrow uh, depletion, but importantly, that recovered. And so the um, investigators at the time started to think about, well, can we use this therapeutically? Can we um, uh, use these drugs to poison uh, cells, but allow patients to recover, um, uh, which is the basis of, of chemotherapy today? And um, as the second half of the last century um, uh, developed, more and more drugs uh, were developed. and. Now, today, there's only about 60 cytotoxic drugs that are available uh, for use. But what has happened over the last um, 
a few years, uh, decades, is the combination of these drugs have been trialled and tested, and in particular the dose um, of how to use them therapeutically. So we haven't had many new cytotoxic drugs in the last um, few years. I guess the, um, the exceptions to that might be the taxanes, which are really um, you know heavily used now in cancer. They've only been around for about 25 years, and um, aribulin is a drug that's used in breast cancer. But there, there isn't many new cytotoxic drugs drugs um, uh, coming into the treatment pathways. Of course, chemotherapy is crude, it's not targeted, and this is um, an important distinction than what we're going to go on to talk to about immunotherapy, and it works by causing um, cell death by damaging the cells as they are cycling. It cannot distinguish between healthy cells from cancer cells, and so part of the problem is we have um, side effects of these treatments. And we give these drugs in combinations because we're trying to capture the cells when they're in different parts of that cell cycle. Um, the dose and the schedule and the intensity is completely dependent on what we're trying to do. If we're trying to aim, aim to cure an individual, we might use big doses, um, uh, frequent combinations. If we're trying to palliate, we tend to be kinder with, with the, um, the approach. But also very important is the patient fitness. So what's the performance status of the patient and what the patient wants. And patients can stay on treatment um, for as long as they're responding or some of the drugs may be time limited because of the damage that they do to normal cells or the side effects may be limiting for the patient to manage the um, receiving the chemotherapy. So there are many ways to classify cytotoxic drugs, uh, but a common one is whether they're cycle dependent or non-cycle dependent. And you can see here on this um, on this uh, cartoon that we have this, the cell cycle in the middle and these drugs work here just before uh, mitosis. These drugs tend to work around when the DNA is being synthesized. And then we have some drugs that are not cell cycle specific. And as a general rule, um, slow growing tumors are usually sensitive to the non cell cycle specific drugs. But there are many ways to classify um, cytotoxic drugs. If we apply that in practice, so here's our cell cycle again with all the nutrients that, um, that, that are required and all the, all the various parts. And I've applied CHOP chemotherapy here. So CHOP is a, is a chemotherapy that's given for lymphoma. So in the middle, we have cyclophosphamide, which is non-cell cycle specific, and that will just go in and disrupt the, um, the, the balance in the cell itself. It's called an alkylating agent and basically poisons the cell. We have the H, which is um, hydroxydoxorubicin, um, which works at DNA um, synthesis side of things. It's an anti-tumor antibiotic, and we'll work at this part. Over here, we have Oncovin, which is vincristine, which works on these spindles. Um, in normal cellular process, the spindles pull apart so that one cell becomes two. Um, the oncovin here makes this process quite sticky, and so they, they can't pull apart and eventually the cell will die. And then we have prednisolone over here when steroids are used in lots of regimens and their, their effect is, um, or the mode of action is really uh, poorly understood, but it's thought it's likely to uh, disrupt the inflammation process that all this activity causes. So that's the reasoning behind we have a regimen-based um, uh, uh, a regimen of different drugs uh, to ap approach to killing uh, lymphoma cells. And of course, chemotherapy is given in cycles, and this is in all the chemotherapy books. And we don't measure how many how many cancer cells we have. We measure um, millimeters and centimeters of tumor size, don't we? We monitor the shadows on scans. We don't actually count the cells, but this is um, this is what the chemotherapy is doing. So we have cancer cells here. We give treatment one. All those cells that were in the right part of the cycle will be affected and we'll lose some. Those that weren't in the right part of the, set of the cycle will continue to grow. And so we just keep hitting the, the cancer with the chemotherapy and eventually you get really low level of cancer cells. Um, the normal cells equally are affected, the normal cells being the rapidly dividing cells that can um, be affected by chemotherapy. They will reduce, but they will recover, they'll reduce and they'll recover. So the, the real reason for having the, 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 um, the space between the treatments is to allow the normal cells to recover. Otherwise, we would um, kill the patient with um, the chemotherapy. And of course, in terms of side effects, the side effects can either be to do with the um, 
the rapidly dividing cells that are being affected. So these are cells of the GI tract, so sore mouth, diarrhea, um, the blood cells and the blood cell production. Um, or it could be to do with the the poison, so the you know the cytotoxic nature of the poison. So um, uh, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting is because we've given poisons, not because we're affecting rapidly dividing cells. Um, and then there are, of course, some very specific side effects depending on the drugs that we're using. There's a lot of work at the moment looking at peripheral neuropathy, for, as a for instance, because some of the drugs are neurotoxic. Um, and some and bone health um, over time. So very acute side effects um, due, due to um, rapidly divided cell um, destruction or to do with poisons and then some late effects as, um, as the body loses its inability to repair. So that's all I was going to say about chemotherapy. I'm sure that was a refresher for many of you. Um, when it comes to biotherapies, this this is definitely the new kid on the block. And Time magazine and um, ASCO um, had sort of heralded this as the you know the biggest breakthrough in cancer treatment um, ever. Um, but again, it's been around for over 100 years. There was this doctor, Dr. Coley, in the um, 1800s who was uh, treating sarcomas. He was a bone surgeon and he um, injected streptococcal uh, bacteria into patients who had sarcoma and saw tumour regression. And so this was he's, he's known to be the father of immunotherapy. But obviously the, um, the molecular biology um, side of things were very um, uh, not known at that point. And so this was observational and um, it's taken you know, 100 years to get to the point that, that we are now where we have really good drugs, immunotherapy drugs in the clinic and um, offering um, some really good outcomes for patients uh, going forward. But it has, as I say, been around for, for many years. So the biotherapies being the, the um, umbrella term for uh, monoclonal antibodies, immune checkpoint inhibitors and CAR T cells and vaccines. I seem to have an extra T there in CAR T. Um, these are the, uh, the domains of the biotherapies. So we saw the structure of the antibody um, at the beginning, and it's important to remember that these work on the outside of the cell. Remember, the chemotherapy goes in and disrupts processes, causes the cell to die, either by bursting the cell or preventing its normal cyclic processes. With monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies, we are looking for a target on the surface of the cell, um, which is really important for the, the drug to go and bind to. Now, I tried to find a, um, a slide that would um, outline all the biomarkers that we have, and biomarkers have only really come on, on board in the last 10, 15 years. We perhaps had in breast cancer, you know, um, uh, ERPR um, status, but these days, uh, you know, everything has a biomarker. And this is just the biomarkers available for lung cancer. And so you can see how um, important it's become. And there's a lot of talk at the moment about this ALK, um, which is a very small percentage of, uh, of uh, lung cancer has uh, there's only a seven percent of people who have an ALK marker, um, but they d traditionally don't uh, respond very well to cytotoxic chemotherapy. Um, but now we have these these drugs that are able to target the ALK and getting some really really good results. But this is just lung cancer, so it's really important that all the cancers are really um, we're beginning to find lots of different biomarkers to target drugs to. So monoclonal antibodies, a really important distinction from chemotherapy is these are they are biologic. So these are made from proteins. They're not synthesized in a um, in a, a in a chemistry way. They are grown and they're grown from one cell, which is why they're called mono and they're targeted therapies, as I said. And that because they're big therapies, they're big proteins, they always work on the outside of the cell. And this has been uh, the subject of biosimilars. You may you may know that we have some biosimilars of Herceptin, uh, Cetuximab, uh, uh, Rituximab, and biosimilars really are um, uh, similar drugs to the, the drug of origin, so um, they're, they're cheaper to uh, manufacture and makes access uh, more available across the world. So the way that they're grown, they're, they're grown in a petri dish by, from one cell and the, all the right ingredients in the right environment is um, is put in place um, as as they you know, if you think of yeast growing as as that multiplies they the actual active ingredient is purified um, where they're, they're then able to um, extract the active ingredient and um, 
that we're able to get a vial of an active drug. And this process takes many months, many years, and there are failures in the manufacturing process. So, um, but the important thing to remember is this is not chemistry, this is biologics, which is why we have some problems with um, ad administering them. So again, this is a cartoon just to illustrate the, the fact that we need to be on the outside of the cell. Um, and it's really important that the, the different drugs um, find their, their particular targets. I seem to have lost my mouse, but um, if you look at A, that particular um, um, growth factor receptor um, anti-EGFR is looking for that particular target. And that's a drug called Cetuximab and going to be um, Bevacizumab Avastin is looking for the VEGF marker. Pertuzumab is looking for the HER2 marker. So all these different markers, the drugs are going to target. And looking at that, just specifically in um, some of the things we see in the clinic. So um, trastuzumab uh, looks on the outside of the cell for the HER2 receptor. And by locking onto that, it can disrupt the processes and we get inhib inhibition of the cancer cell proliferation. So the cancer cell will die. With the bevacizumab, this particularly works on um, the blood supply to a tumour. Excuse me. So um, once a, once a tumour gets uh, to a certain size, it can't survive without create, creating some nutrients, and so it develops its own blood supply. But this blood supply is quite deranged, and it's not it's not normal. Um, and so the bevacizumab has been um, is an antibody that's been developed to disrupt that process, and it blocks this angiogenic switch. And so by doing that, you will destroy the blood supply, and by destroying the blood supply, the tumour can't survive, and therefore the cell will die. In the bottom left, we have ipilimumab, which is slightly different. This is one of the drugs called CTLA-4, and this particular drug works on the T cell, not on the tumour cell. And this is this is really um, activating and proliferating the T cell to be able to attack the tumour cell. Um, so it's not actually working on the tumour cell it, shell itself. Whereas nivolumab in the bottom right um, is working on the shield that protects um, the tumour cell. Tumour cells are, are, are clever in that they have been able to evade the, um, the immune system because the immune system by right should recognise non-self, it should recognise this isn't a normal cell and start to destroy it, but they have these protective mechanisms so they can hide from the um, the immune system and nivolumab breaks down that shield and it's called a pdl one drug. Um, it just um, uncovers the shield to allow the T cells to go in and destroy the um, what they recognised as being non-self. And so again, applying that to practice, here's our um, CHOP regimen. So we have the cyclophosphamide and the doxorubicin, the vincristin and the prednisone as part of the chemotherapy um, regimen, disrupting the cell processes to prevent cell division. Um, rituximab, so now we have our CHOP, is working on the CD20 receptor on the B cell. And by looking into that CD20 uh, receptor, the B cells can't proliferate and the cells will die. This is another example of um, how the uh, immunotherapy has really uh, made a difference to malignant melanoma. And this has been the big success really of the last 10 years. Um, so we mentioned that the ipilimumab turns on the immune system at the T cell. So it will start to um, activate the T cell to start um, getting its destructive pro um, proteins and products ready so that if it's able to get into um, to get access to the tumour cell, it can start destroying it. And working alongside the nivolumab, which takes this shield away on the tumour cell, this activated T cell is now able to get in and start to destroy that tumour cell. And this has been a big success in um, malignant melanoma. And this is just a slide to illustrate why the, um, why uh, monoclonal antibodies are fraught with uh, um, administration problems really. Remember this is a biologic, it is a protein, it's not chemistry. And the early days, the um, much of the, the compound was what, what they call mouse models. So it was it's sort of for, foreign protein, whereas today the um, a lot of them are humanized. Um, but obviously, um, if you start infusion, infusing um, mouse proteins into patients, the, the immune system is going to recognize non-self and start to react. And we saw some really, really wild um, infusion related reactions in the early days, giving these monoclonal antibodies. Um, and 
most mostly now they are humanized or near humanized um but anything that is given um with a degree of protein <clears throat> that is uh, that the body could recognize as non-self these are the drugs that need the uh, pre-meds to go with them whereas the humanized ones you probably don't need the pre-meds um to uh, before infusion now and the side effects of um uh, the monoclonal antibodies depend on the mode of action. So we we talked about the eGFR, the epidermal um, uh, monoclonal antibodies that are looking to attach onto this eGFR um, antigen on the on the cell surface, and um, because it's epidermal, um, they tend to cause rash and nail changes as, as well as some other things. And I don't know if this picture particularly projects well, but this is a terrible, terrible rash. This this gent has really big. Um, acne, pustule, you know, pus-filled pustules, and the the middle of his chest there is very, very scabby, um, very, very painful, very sore. And this is the um, the cetuximab attacking the um, epidermal growth factors. When we think about the anti-angiogenic, the VEGF, this is the bevacizumab. We're breaking down the blood cells uh, or the blood supply, um, and so the side effects can be bleeding, hypertension, and delayed healing. And then when, when we think about the HER2, um, so the trastuzumab, the pertuzumab, um, there are HER2 uh, receptors in the cardiac muscle, and so they can attack the monocytes and the myocytes, and, um, and this is why we need to monitor um, ejection fraction for people on these drugs to make sure that we're not um, doing harm. So side effects very much depend on the mode of action. When it comes to the um, the PDL1 drugs, the nivolumab and the CTL. Uh, CTLA-4 drugs, um, ipilimumab, um, th the side effects here are itis related. So anything that you can put itis on the end of it, so pneumonitis, hepatitis, nephritis, colitis, dermatitis, um, problems with the thyroid, diabetes, um, adrenal crisis, hypophysitis in the brain. And what's happened here is we've turned the immune system up too high you know it's, it's overacting it's overstimulating and if we get any of these particular side effects to any degree we need really need to turn down the immune system and that is when we might use some take them off treatment and use some steroids and these effects are not like the uh, the effects of cytotoxic treatment sort of diarrhea that we get with cytotoxic treatment which is very cyclical um, response to loperamide as the gut repairs itself the you know the the um, the stools and the the gi tract starts to act as normal if you get any degree of colitis or diarrhea with um, with immunotherapy it can certainly be life threatening and you can lose your um your, some, some of your bowel surgically. Um, similarly, with um, if you get a, a pneumonitis, you can end up with, with proper restrictions in, in your breathing. So these are very serious and need to be dialed down. And so coaching for, of the patient is really important to um, act early. In terms of vaccines, um, still a lot in clinical trials um, in terms of treatment of cancers. Um, and again, it uses the immune system to recognize the cancer cell. We do have one uh, very common one in practice, which is an on oncolytic virus vaccine called TVEC. This is uh, a virus that's been engineered from the herpes simplex virus, and um, it's injected directly into cutaneous um, malignant melanoma. And once in the cell environment, it starts to replicate and it starts to attack the tumour from within. And it's very it's very commonly used in uh, cutaneous um, malignant melanoma. I'm not going to say anything about CAR T cells, except to say it's uh, it's very compl complex. It's very specialised. It's um, it's a similar to a transplant process where an individual would have their white cells collected. The white cells then get sent off. I believe they go to Germany to get genetically engineered and peripherate, and they start to proliferate, and they get sent back to us. And we've prepared the patient, and the patient would receive the um, the T cells in the same way that they would receive a bone marrow transplant very simplistic it's very um specialized as a national ndt for approval um the patients would you know might end up in a, in uh, itu uh, with cytokine release syndrome have a very um serious uh, recovery process but it's a one-off treatment and is very promising um going forward i think there's about 10 centers in the country who deliver car t cells 
So finally, the, the next, the final category of group um, of treatments that I'm going to talk about is small molecules. And these are called um, because they are small enough to enter the cell. So remember that the antibodies are on the outside of the cell, the molecules are on the inside of the cell, and they are targeted um, therapy uh, based on biomarkers. They're mostly tablets, and this is what we call the NIBs, MIBs, SIBs and RIBs. That's, the, that's how the, the drug names end. And the big breakthrough came here with a drug called imatinib. This is a treatment for CLL and um, it was a small trial. Um, I think the trial was in 1999 and it got its license very quickly because it had a 100% success rate um, in uh, reversing um, the molecular mechanics of CLL. Um, and so that started a whole world of molecular biology um, investigation and it's been um, quite a proliferation of drugs over the last 20 years. So as I said, um, um, small molecules work inside of the cell and it's really important that we, you know, we don't try, um, try to be molecular biologists. We don't need to understand all these numbers and all these names and all these pathways, uh, but we do need to understand the concept. And the concept basically is a tube map. Um, if, you know, just very simplistically, if the nucleus of the cell is Oxford Circus and the food chain for a particular cancer is um, the Bakerloo line. I don't even know if I'm saying the right things here, but you know, if I get on at Richmond um, and the food chain needs to go down to get to the nucleus to get to Oxford Circus, I can block one of the stations. And if the station's blocked, the food chain can't get through. Over time, cancers get clever, so they'll get to that station and they'll realise, well, actually, I can get off here and go round the back and get on a different line and get to Oxford Street and get to the nucleus of the cell. And that's really all you need to understand about um, how these small molecules work, unless you really want to be a um, molecular biologist. You might want to understand individual drugs based on the, um, the specialty that you work in. So how we apply that in practice. Uh, oh, sorry, one more slide. Um, this is... Um, uh, how a PARP inhibitor might work. So um, within cell processes, there are uh, normal points in the cell cycle where the cell will check itself to say, am I, am I replicating correctly? And if there's any problems, it will repair itself. And a healthy cell can do that very well. If you put a PARP inhibitor in place, the, the healthy cell will find a way to avoid that and will uh, find a way to um, repair the cell and continue cycling and off it will go. If it's a cancer cell, um, the cancer cells are, aren't able to report, repair these, um, these mechanisms uh, very readily. And so if you give them a PARP inhibitor, it causes DNA damage and the cell is then unable to use these alternative methods and the cell will die. And this is the case, uh, it's the new innovations with ovarian cancer. So here we have the cell cycle at the top with the traditional chemotherapy. So this would be a cisplatin or a carboplatin, um, uh, generally with a paclitaxel. And then plus or minus a monoclonal antibody bevisuzumab, depending on the, um, the biomarkers for that particular um, individual. Um, but if they get a durable response uh, with um, this, the, the chemotherapy, then they can go on to have these drugs called alaparib or naraparib, and these work on a PARP inhibitor um, in, within the path within the um, the cell cycle within the cell. And if you block the um, uh, the PARP pathway, that cell can't replicate. And again, this has been uh, a real innovation over the last ten years. And, and patients get maintenance alaparib, uh, naraparib, and they're getting durable responses. Similarly, this is a this is a fantastic breakthrough for breast cancer. This is um, metastatic breast cancer who are uh, PR positive, HER2 negative. They can have first line treatment with a small molecule. So the potentially um, a patient with a brand new diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer or perhaps a relapse of an early breast cancer. If it's their first line treatment, they can get um, about 18 months worth of um, treatment. Uh, without disease progression and in fact disease response um, without having the need to have any chemotherapy. So this is this is fantastic. And this particular pathway works on the um, CDK4-6 um, pathway and the, the pathway here on the um, on the right, it, it works at the beginning of the cell cycling and it switches on this um, mitogenic signal and it sends the, the, the cancer cell into cycle. If we can block that pathway, that CDK4 pathway, um, 4 6 pathway, um, that, that, that chain of events can't happen and so the cell dies. And these drugs are called palbocyclib, abemocyclib and ribocyclib. And these have been a fantastic innovation in the last um, five years, really. 
the side effects of the small molecules tend to be quite vague and uh, generally they're very well tolerated. Uh, there is some problems uh, with long term um, anemia and uh, fatigue, but these can usually be managed with lifestyle change and um, occasionally people um, come off treatment, but mostly they're very manageable. And then finally, just as another example, this is a non-small cell cancer, which um, lung cancer, which uh, combines all three. So here we have um, a treatment that has uh, a cytotoxic, it has a small molecule and it has an immunotherapy. And again, this is um, offering durable responses where, where there was none before. Um, and so the, these combinations are very mainstay now. So to conclude, we've had, we've had great advances in treatment options over the last couple of decades and one size no longer fits all. The biomarkers have become very important. The molecular biologists have, um, have really um, become important members of our, of our MDT. Um, the combination therapy of all types of therapy are now very commonplace. And as a recommendation, uh, for particularly if you're if you're youngsters and going to be uh, around for a long time, it is really important to understand the language um, of molecular uh, biology, but not not the detail, the, the language. And there are many courses now looking to understand um, uh, the in order for us to be able to uh, advocate for patients and be able to teach patients about um, how to maintain their therapy and stay on on treatment and stay well. But there's more. Um, and so I'm going to hand over um, to Domitia now to take us through how we refine treatments even more based on uh, genomics and genomics. Thank you. So if I could just introduce Domitia while she is um, getting herself ready. Um, so Domitia um, has spoken to us before in the past and she has uh, has been a pharmacist at the uh, Royal Marsden for a, for a long time, but has had um, a, a new role more recently um, in being the lead geno genomic pharmacist. So you do take it away, um, Domitia. Thank you. Hi, can everyone hear and see my slides OK? I can see them. Right. So I'm going to do uh, a focus on pharmacogenomics because um, it's going to be a huge um, uh, power through with NHS England to get some pharmacogenomic testing onto the NHS. So um, before I start, I'll just do a brief overview on the Genomic Medicine Service Alliance and I'll do an overview of why it's in, what, what the GMSI, GMSAs are doing um, and what it's doing with in terms of pharmacogenomics. So seven um, NHS Genomic Medicine Service Alliances across the country were placed together um, and that was in tandem with NHS Genomic Laboratory Hubs. So within the North Thames, which the Royal Marsden is a part of, um, the Royal Marsden Hospital is a genomic laboratory hub for North Thames in terms of somatic mutation testing, and then um, Great Ormond Street Hospital does the germline testing. So the aim is to have an NHS system level approach where we'll work with cancer alliances and integrated care systems and regional teams to ensure that there's leadership in genomic medicine across um, our region and at a national level in England. There'll be some clinical leadership involved here so that we'll engage with clinical leaders and advocates and champions across the geography to help disseminate the information and allow clinical app um, application at the clinical level at patient um, facing level. But this will require transformational projects. So here we have a number of uh, transformational projects, but I'll just be speaking about the pharmacogenomics one in due to time. And it's also a lot about workforce development um, in terms of improving the genomic literacy across nursing, midwifery and amongst the pharmacy workforce. So the main priorities in NHS Genomic Medicine Service Alliance is to ensure you have quicker diagnosis to rare conditions and for cancers as well, personalising treatments and making sure that we have a better understanding of the underlying cause of many conditions. So these are the seven GMS alliances and we are part of this small one's it's kind of in bright yellow, um, but in terms of population density, we are the biggest in that sense because there's quite a lot of people that live in North London. So having um, like a bit more of a magnified look at it, um, North Thames GMS Alliance, which um, we're master a part of, also includes Hertfordshire, parts of Hertfordshire and Essex. Um, and there are five integrated care systems that overlap all of this region, which um, the North Thames GMSA will work with, as well as regional medicine optimisation committees. Um, and it will encompass primary care, secondary care, mental health um, around this setting as well. So in order to um, have pharmacogenomics uh, implemented across the region, there has to be a clinical strategy. And this was 
put into place by a number of key documents. So there are two main NHS um, national documents, and the one is at the top is Genome UK. And within this, they have um, they mentioned pharmacogenomic profiling, um, where it should be attached to patients' medical records to support clinicians on making therapeutic decisions for the benefit of patients. And this is supported by the 2019 NHS long term plan where um, molecular diagnostics and genomics should be implemented routinely into clinical care. In terms of um, pharmacogenomics and the pharmacy based practice documents, there is one from the um, professional board standard agency on how to ensure that genomic data is placed into patients electronic record systems safely. And a couple of months ago, um, the Royal College of Physicians, alongside the British um, Pharmacology Society, put in place some best practice recommendations on how to implement pharmacogenomics safely into clinical settings. So this is all really about optimising treatments approach and using a more personalised approach. And we've just heard how there's so many SAC treatments that can do this. And it pretty much started from novel therapeutics within cancer. And there's a whole range and host of different types of treatments in terms of new technology, which you know, CAR T cells mentioned, and there's lots of trials at Royal Mars of the Til cell therapy. And then you have your tumour um, genomic basis of personalised treatments. And also you can predict treatment resistance using um, particular biomarkers. But the focus of this presentation will be pharmacogenomics, so how to guide um, treatment decisions on basing it on drug dosing um, and dose reductions. So having a little bit closer look at the personalising prescribing documents, um, the reason why we need to do this and implement this across the NHS is because um, there's unwanted side effects from prescription drugs, as we know, and that can cost the NHS 530 billion annually in hospital admissions. So in England alone, um, the NHS dispensed well over 1 billion prescriptions, predominantly in primary care, but this is 50% more um, than 2005. So this document states out eight main recommendations how to ensure that you get um, pharmacogenomics implemented in primary and secondary centres, and not just in specialised centres, but across the spectrum, and how that um, pharmacogenomics should be mainstreamed using the National Test Directory, and how we have comprehensive education and training packages, as well as ensuring that we continually learn and put research into the focus of our care pathways. And importantly, how patients and publics can be involved in the service design of um, pharmacogenomic or genomic medicine. So before we um, proceed with what pharmacogenomics is, we just need a couple of definitions. So when we think about genomics, that is the study of an organism's complete set of um, genetic information. And genetics here is a study of the function and composition of single genes. And this is no different to pharmacogenomics. So here, pharmacogenomics is looking at um, both the coding and non-coding region on drug responses and what will make a drug more ineffective or more effective for certain people. And pharmacogenetics is looking at the impact of a single gene um, for one specified medicine or a group of medicines in some cases and the effect it has within the body. So pharmacogenomics essentially combined in genomics with pharmacology and then thinking about how it is safe and effective to prescribe and tailor a particular medication to a patient. So this could mean that a person's DNA, um, that individuals, some may respond to a normal dose, some may respond to a lower dose or a higher dose, and some the treatment might be completely contraindicated and they need an alternative medication. So when we look at the prescribing in primary care, we know that at least 95% of the population carry at least one genetic variant that will result in some form of treatment adjustment. And if we have a look at primary care data, 58% of patients can be prescribed at least one pharmacogenetic drug, 47% of patients can be prescribed at least two, and the likelihood of exposure to a pharmacogenomic drug increases. So the older a patient becomes here, that if someone is over the age of 70, they're more likely to be exposed, in this case, almost up to 90%. So what does it mean by normal response, lower response? Well, when we take a look at patients' genes and their variants, we look at metabolizing traits. So this is where you say to your pharmacist, um, you know, is there any drug interactions? Why is this patient having adverse reactions? And it could be because of what their DNA is doing to their medication. 
So when we look at a variant of a gene when it links to uh, a pharmacology or in terms of a drug, we call them pharmacogenes. And these are functional and they lead to a particular enzyme metabolizing trait. So these are what you think of the enzymes, for example. And this is called the phenotype, so what happens to the drug when it's metabolized by the enzyme. And then these are then um, divided into act activity scores and you get three main categories. So you can have a patient who is an ultra rapid metabolizer and therefore they may need a higher dose. You may have patients that um, just normally metabolize the drug, so they just need a normal BNF dose, for example. You can have those that are alternative or as intermediate metabolizers, so they may need a lower dose, or they can be a poor metabolizer, so they may need a completely different drug altogether. Um, so there are many different guidelines available. So these are different genes in these columns here. So as you can see, there's DPYD and there's some cancer drugs as well. So here you've got Dornarubicin, Doxorubicin, and these are all genes that affect the metabolism of a drug. And all of these genes have some form of national guidelines. But before these guidelines can be used or before the genes can be tested, they have to be reviewed at an NHS level. And this is done at, um, within the national test directory. And this is to ensure that there is equitable access to testing. So what is the National Test Directory? So you may have heard about this. So there are two main um, national test directories. There's one for cancer. So it tells you all the um, genetic tests that are commissioned on the NHS. And there's also one for rare diseases. So the aim of these test directories is to ensure that there's a fair and equitable access to genomic testing that it reflects the up-to-date technology developments and scientific advances, and that it's best value for money on the NHS, and that we can improve our understanding of clinical pathways and the testing pathways. So there's two pharmacogenetic testing available on the NHS. One is DPYD, which is inserted into the, into the cancer test directory, and there's one for aminoglycosides, so gentamicin also has a pharmacogenomic test that is implemented into the NHS. Um, so the aim is that these, if a clinician wants to test on the NHS, it has to be placed into the test evaluation working group before it gets in the test directory. Um, and there are three main ones. There's three working groups. One is for rare diseases, one's for cancer, and the other one's for pharmacogenomics. So say that I wanted one for doxorubicin and there's a pharmacogenomic test, I'll fill in an application. It will get reviewed by the pharmacogenomics working group. They will then review it at a higher level within the genomics clinical reference group and the genomics program board at NHS England will review the cost analysis of it. And if they approve it, it will be placed on the test directory for national implementation within England. So we are in the North Thames. So how are North Thames GMSA Alliance implementing pharmacogenomics across the region? So I left my role in um, as a skin and melanoma pharmacist in August 2023. And before I started, I was asked to come in to develop a workforce kind of strategy with nurses and midwives. And the aim is that in order to implement pharmacogenomics, we're going to have some genomic champions, um, particularly in pharmacy, because it's all to do with pharmacy drugs. Um, and we're going to try and use these um, champions um, and our networks within nurse and midwifery and pharmacy to think about how we can um, improve workforce development in terms of improving genomic literacy and how um, genes can be um, interpreted and what it means for the patient. And looking a little bit closely at pharmacogenomic drug gene panels and how we implement that and have underlying research involved. And according to this, we'll have three golden threads running through all our foundational projects, and that will be in terms of education training, research development and building trust with our patients, public and carers. So the first one that was approved on the National Texas Directory was a DPYD for fluoropyrimidines, um, and this is one you'll be familiar with because we do this routinely. Um, within the Royal Marsden. So DPD stands for dihydropyrimidine dehydrogenase, and this enzyme is coded by the DPYD gene. So DPD is involved in the metabolism of, um, of 5 fluorouracil capcytopin in Tegafer, which is prescribed as you know, predominantly in gastrointestinal breast and head and neck cancers. So the DPD deficiency is called by germline or inherited variants of the DP, um, DPYD gene. And then if you have one of these inherited variants, you may have a greater risk of side effects. Um, and this was because um, the MHRA um, alert 
stated that there were cases of patients dying because they weren't tested for this gene and therefore they said we should be doing this routinely and they had fatal toxicities in terms of stomatitis, diarrhea, neutropenia, um, neurotoxicity and mucosal inflammation. And these are the four variants that we test and it's important to know that these four variants are based on evidence predominantly from the white population. So data from other populations is lacking, especially in North Thames is a very diverse area that we serve. So part of the project um, that we did um, with at a national level um, within England, we had to do a national survey. So within North Thames, we have 14 cancer providing trusts. And we did this survey to ensure that there's, if there's any geographical variation and any barriers to accessing the test. So we found out reassuringly that all patients across our region do get tested before they have treatment and that all clinicians knew some form of guideline to guide dose reductions and that Though we found this, um, but however, we found that there's um, variations in turn testing turnaround times. So we've been working with trusts that had a turnaround time of greater than six to 10 working days. But using this information, we were able to provide a gold standard pathway because DPYD will be an exemplar test on how we can implement other pharmacogenomic tests at a national level. So retrospectively, we did a audit and this was voluntary. So we had seven out of 14 trusts participate in this voluntary audit. And it was to identify if patients had a DPYD panel test prior to fluorobidine um, initiation. And if it was normal, if it was negative, but it had a toxicity, was it due to a potentially unidentified variant? So different to the ones that we test um, on the NHS. And is it because um, they were from non-European ancestry. So the results are being analysed because um, even though we had a total of 321 patients within the audit, it, it kind of showcased that we have more work to do in terms of um, looking at our diversity. And so we're thinking about the next steps on how we can improve this. So at the moment, we are working with patient and public and carer panels within North Thames to have a look at the pathway and see where it can be improved. And we're also looking at patient information for DPYD because it's really important they are involved um, and see what their point of view is in terms of the pathway. So I mentioned um, diversity. So why did I mention this? Well, as I stated that the four DPYD variants are in white European populations, we have found that there are variants that are particular to African ancestry. So here there is one variant, um, the C557A, which has a three to five percent carrier frequency. So this isn't currently tested because more evidence is needed, but there are case studies um, that are now available. And this one is about an Indian woman who had the four routine DPYD test there, um, tested, but she had severe mucositis of the ileum and she needed ICU admission. And when they did further whole genome sequencing, they found that they, she had a DPYD variant that wasn't um, that wasn't identified before. So there are global groups looking at DPYD testing in different populations. And here's one in India looking at the Indian population. So it'll be interesting to see whether we need to include different types of variants to test to make sure that our whole population is included. The other test that is available is one for aminoglycoside autotoxicity. And again, this was from an MHRA alert um, that was published on 7th of January 2021. And this is where aminoglycosides, such as gentamicin, they have a side effect that causes autotoxicity, but sometimes it's because of a gene. So this gene, M5555A to G, is present in approximately 0.2% of the population. And if they have this variant, even after one dose of gentamicin, they can become deaf. Um, so therefore, it's really important to identify this patient, even though it's quite rare. However, um, this testing takes about six to 10 days, so it can't be used where you need to um, use the antibiotic urgently um, because you can't wait in some cases for infection. So this is where um, the genetic testing will be used, where you'd want to plan the treatment, especially for those who have recurrent or long term treatment with aminoglycosides, such as patients with cystic fibrosis. So at the moment, this is the indication for the test, but this is due to be amended um, and it may include um, a more broader group, not just cystic fibrosis and patients with bronchiectasis or those with um, genital urinary tract disorders. However, taking um, into consideration that this is a long turnaround time for this particular test, there was a pilot study called the PALO study, 
Um, and this study was done in neonates because when um, babies are put into NICU, they need to get gentamicin within an hour of, of um, being born as a prophylactic antibiotic, and that's a national standard. So within Manchester, they did um, they looked at a new technology called the gene drive point of care test, which can detect this particular gene variant in 26 minutes from a buccal swab. And this was integrated into um, clinical care pathways and the nurses were trained on how to do this. And the results were that they had a total of 751 neonates recruited and they found that there were three babies that had this variant that if they had the gentamicin, they would have gone deaf um, or they would have had profound hearing loss, which can affect their development. Um, and they found out that this particular gene drive point of care test had real world sensitivity of 100% and specificity of 99% and had an accuracy level of 99.2%. So this is a way where we can use point of care testing and rapidly use genomics to help um, patients. And so where this can be more widely um, um, used will be really interesting. At the moment, this technology is being reviewed by NICE. Another test that's in the pipeline um, and will be coming soon at, at the end of the year and the one that I'm working on in terms of looking at pathways and looking at the guidelines is one called TPMT and NIF15 for acute lymphoblastic leukaemia for patients 6 and captopurin and 6 thioguanine. So within the ALL trial for paediatrics, they do actually test for these variants, um, but the aim is to get it on the national test directory so those that are not in the trial can have equability access of this test. So if they have a variant in one of these genes, then they're at higher risk of um, neurotoxicity, and this will be um, able to be requested by haematologists. However, there are tests on the national that are not on the national test directory and that have been used for quite a while, and these are two examples. One is Abacavir, which is a HIV um, drug that prevents um, viral replication. And if you have this variant, the HLA-B5701, they are at higher risk of hypersensitivity syndrome. So therefore, if um, they've been tested for it, then they cannot have a Bacavir. And this test was, has been in use since 2002. Similarly, in the early 2000s, carbamazepine and this particular variant HLA-B1507 is more prevalent in Southeast Asian um, patients and individuals. So if they have this variant, then they're at high risk of Stevens-Johnson um, syndrome or TENS. And, um, so therefore, they can't be treated with carbamazepine or even phenytoin or oxcarbamazepine, which is used for epilepsy, bipolar, affective disorders and trigeminal neuralgia. So in Singapore and Thailand, this is actually done as population screening to identify um, people in the population who absolutely cannot have this drug. So in the future, um, what is happening? Um, I think there may be more um, entry within the national test directory of SIP enzyme pharmacogenetic testing, which I alluded to before. And given just a bit of a snapshot, um, in North Thames, um, we have a regional project of antidepressants, so I'll explain about that in my next few slides. But there's also one about clopidogrel for strokes um, um, and percutaneous um, interventions um, when patients have a heart, post a heart attack. So if they have a particular variant, they won't be able to have effectiveness for clopidogrel, so they need a different type of cardiovascular drug. And you can also do a similar test for tamoxifen. So that just gives you a snapshot of some of the SIP um, enzyme genomics that can be used on the NHS, maybe in the future. So what are we doing at a regional level? So at the moment, we're trying to improve genomic literacy before all of this testing becomes available. So we, I've developed a North Thames Pharmacy Champion Network. So we have 32 champions across all sectors and I update them and do regular educational and awareness sessions with them at every quarter and provide newsletters. Um, another piece of project we're doing with Health Education England and the Academy of Royal Colleges Genomic Syllabus is we build in a multidisciplinary competency framework for genomic champions. So they, they use the word advisors, but it's essentially I use the word champion. And it's to look at how we can look at competency framework in terms of knowledge, clinical skills and strategy for um, understanding what people need to know about um, genomic um, literacy um, and competency frameworks. So we piloted this with a nurse, midwife and a lead pharmacist within North Thames GMSA. And the next phase is to um, pilot it with local level um, um, professionals. And then hopefully we can use the national level so that individuals can map how much um, they know and how much education and further training they need. 
and this is an example of what um, the competency framework will look like. So another project that we're doing is in mental health. Um, so there's a lot of um, variability in um, pharmacogenomics when it comes to mental health. Um, so 50% of patients don't respond to their first antidepressants and 30% of patients will discontinue in the first six weeks, especially um, in terms of enzymes here, CYP2C19 and CYP2D6. So I'm working with a psychiatrist who has a clinical trial open looking at pharmacogenomic testing and she's going to recruit 2000 patients and 400 of them will have pharmacogenomic guided treatment and the outcomes will be looked at. And what we'll do is we're going to develop a pharmacist specialist interest group um, to help interpret these reports and how we can um, do that um, and by improving genomic literacy and how we can actually interpret reports. So I started off with just having a pharmacy group, but in fact, I'm going, it's going to be developed as a uh, multidisciplinary group. So we're going to have uh, psychiatrists on board, research fellows, um, mental health care pharmacy specialists, and I'm hoping to recruit a clinical nurse specialist so that we can also develop um, educational training um, sessions and workshops. So this is what our project will look like. So it's just an overall strategy, but it gives you a flavour of the activities that we'll be doing um, in order to lift this project off the ground. So what are the future projects? Um, so when um, so I just really want to do more panel testing, and the reason for this is that it may be more cost effective rather than just doing one gene drug um, pharmacogenetic test at a time. So Northwest GMS Alliance um, are leading on the pharmacogenomic projects and they're based in Manchester and Liverpool. And they've got a project called a Progress Project and it's going to be a primary care project looking at panel testing for drugs such as cardiovascular drugs, antidepressants, proton pump inhibitors and some other commonly used drugs. And they're going to ask GPs and practices to help implement this. So what they're going to do is develop and validate a pharmacogenomic panel test and then how it can the information be relayed from labs to the primary care and how we can implement it with GPs and pharmacists. So in North Thames we'll be asked to participate in 2023-2024 and we'll be asked to work with our genomic laboratory hubs into looking into lab facilities for the local level to scope out GP surgeries especially those that have a phlebotomy service and good pharmacy networks and how we can look at placing information into patient records and making sure we have patient and public involvement. So there's future considerations that we need to look into. So when I first started in August 20, on, on the 23rd of August, my first aim was to do engagement sessions and develop networks and assess the readiness. And the next two years will more be about education and planning. So how we improve genomic literacies, linking up with pharmacy schools, working on multidisciplinary level and, and reaching out to primary care so that the future will more, be more about scalability, quality assurance and quality control and the more digital aspects of it. Um, so there's lots of key considerations and these are the few that I've come up with, but I just want to focus on two main things that we need to consider in the first few years. And the first thing is education training. So how do we interpret the results? Because pharmacogenomics won't replace our clinical judgment, it's going to be an additional tool. So we still need to consider things like renal and liver function, drug interactions, drug food interactions, comorbidities. So there's lots to consider and there's a lot of learning to do around that. The second aspect is how do we test and access the results? So do we do single gene testing as we do for DPYD? It's just a few variants. Or do we just do a whole panel of testing? And then if that happens, then how do we ensure that all that data gets a, um, um, pass forward and one idea is doing a pharmacogenomics passport so patients carry it around in their wallets and so if they enter A&E or specialist centres or their primary care if the doctor doesn't, doesn't have it at hand or the prescriber doesn't have it at hand especially those who are non who are independent prescribers they'd be able to see this um, as within their passport and there's also a lot of direct consumer testing so we need to do um, a lot of um, awareness about this and the limitations because there's some pharmacies that are going to be selling um, pharmacogenomic testing panels to patients. So we just need to be on top of that. So there's lots of things to consider. Um, if you are interested, we do have a showcase of genomics and um, it's next week um, and we're going to be covering um, cancer, paediatric medicine, pharmacogenomics. So you can dip in 
in and out of the session um, and each session will be like 20 minutes long so they're short bite sized but you get an idea of what's happening in the region if you are interested thank you so much uh Darmisha. it's it's getting so complicated isn't it and um, and time sensitive as well in terms of you know when we do these tests because we've got people who want treatment haven't we as well um I, I can't i can't see any questions but please do put some in the chat um if you wish we've just got a uh, couple of minutes um thing that jumped into my head when you were talking there was around consent so i know we, we don't consent for dypd we just do you know we, we counsel but we don't consent whereas if we were looking for say a BRCA gene we we would and we'd do some some genetic counseling wouldn't we but um there's there, there's no consent no thinking of consent for for these sort of um no so we issues. actually raised this question at our and public involvement panel um because we just assume we don't need to test and i think that's the right way to do with dpyd but they were saying that actually they consider it as a normal genetic test so they feel like it's a positive test that if they did the test then it's good that they won't get side effects um so they said we don't necessarily need to be consented for this we don't need too much information because we have already bombarded with a lot of information and we just need it at our point of care so it was good to see that they confirmed what we were thinking um, so in terms of consent, um, if it is a single gene test, we may not need to do it. So they consider it, consider it as just a normal biochemistry test that you do along with other safety tests. But I think the, prop, the issue with consent may come along if you did panel testing because they are um, inherited. And if they did panel testing for cardiovascular drugs or antiemetics, they may want, if they test and they may want their children to be tested because yeah. they're, they tend to, so that may be a little bit different. Um, but germline tests like for a BRCA, that definitely needs some kind of consent process because that's, I think there's some testing that we're going to consider would definitely need um, more of a robust system. But I think pharmacogenetics, it depends how you're testing it and how many genes you're testing. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, our hour is up. Um, I hope you found that uh, useful. And obviously, Domish is going to be a great resource to have in our region. And um, I hope you're able to access some of those um, education sessions and think about that conference uh, next week. Um, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Domish. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining the call. We will get our certificate sorted for you. We are now finished for the summer. So I wish you great both. Um, both. I wish you all um, a very, very nice summer and we'll be back in September um, and uh, I hope you'll be able to join us there. So bye bye for now. Have a great afternoon.